been a champion skater, an accomplished musician, and a special assistant for the FBI, all without the benefit of hearing. Sue Thomas has titled her life story, appropriately, Silent Night. And uh, how neat to see Washington in the background there. Sue, we met in the summer, but you are back in time to tell us how you spend your Christmas. Can't wait. Thank you. But first, some are seeing you for the first time. Uh, you've been profoundly deaf since 18 months of age. Nobody knows why, but you are an amazing lip reader. Yes. How long did it take for you to be able to do this? Well, I had to learn to speak, and it was learning to talk that I gained the lip reading abilities that wasn't like I took lip reading 101. Yeah. So many, many years that have gone into this, and I still am kindred at times with beard and mustaches, but as long as I can see the lips, I can read them. <laughs> what brought you into the employ of the FBI? It was my lip reading ability. Ah. I became the uh, secret weapon. <laughs> uh, nobody knew what was going on simply because I'd be sitting at a table and watching uh, the bad guys talk and I would read their lips and I'd tell the good guys what the bad guys were saying and they even paid me to do it. So uh, it threw me into a world of, of glamour, of celebrity, because I was the only one that could do it. And for three and a half years, I lived in the fast lane of Washington, D.C., celebrating my success. But to be honest with you, it was during that time that even though I had gained the notary and I had become the successful person because of my deafness and reading lips, I was still carrying that baggage um, of resentment, uh, of hatred and bitterness for my worst enemy, my deafness. Even though that it threw me into the world of the glamour and success, it was something that um, I regretted. I never wanted. And so many times I cried out to God, please give me back my, my hearing. So at the end of three and a half years, um, I realized there had to be a lot, lot more than Washington thing. And I resigned on a journey, my quest, to find out the answer from God directly, why I was deaf, why he allowed it, and did he really make a mistake in my life? Mm. I found the answer. How long did it take? The answer was found in seminary. Basically, at the foot of the cross, I surrendered my awe. I couldn't fight with God anymore. I mean, when you have a battle on your hand between God and you, let's face it, you're not going to win. But through that course of that time, I came to realize that I couldn't live in my world of silence, that if God wanted me to live in that silence, he was gonna have to live there with me. And so at that point, I just totally died. I surrendered and I said, you want me to live? Just do it. And from that moment on, I have walked with God and the journey has been an incredible one. Mm. Uh, this of course has inspired uh, an award-winning TV series, Sue Thomas FB. I. <laughs> this is uh, oh, this is volume one. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm just going to show a clip to uh, you. You were pretty particular about the girl who would play you. <laughs> a us. nice, tall, thin blonde. <laughs> okay. Here, in case you haven't seen the program, which I can still see every week, um, still playing all over the world. Uh, the the foundation for this story, the real Sue Thomas. Here's what it looks like on television. I have this feeling we've digressed. So what is this little bookworm club? Deaf adults and older kids read to little kids who are deaf. Signing them stories, help them learn to read. Sounds noble. And Sue and the newly 13-year-old, therefore officially one of the older kids, Amanda, are the club's two newest members. It's like when we were kids and we had story time at the library, only this is one-on-one. -on -one. I don't know if you ordered the dashing co-star did you have a love interest when you were in Washington? That's all Hollywood. That's Hollywood. It's a wonderful program, and the Faith Foundation is not hidden in the program. We see God in every episode. That's what the criteria was when they wanted to do the show. There was two things that I wanted. It would be for home, for mom and dad and the kids, 
that no matter what adversary, somebody would be able to find the home. And secondly, it would be seen for the glory of God and for him and him alone. Mm -hmm. I could never imagine how God would use the FBI days actually to bring me to the foot of the cross and then later to have this TV show. 64 nations around the 64 world, 64 now. nations are able to watch this. We get emails from Malaysia, Singapore, Italy, all over. And for the most part, people think they have this big celebrity in me. And in actual truth, I share celebrity now, God's greatest sinner saved by his grace. Mm. Yes. Wonderful message. I'm going to very quickly show a few pictures from the beautiful book, beautifully produced book. Um, just some slices of your life quickly. Uh, the Ohio skating champion first. How old were you in this I was picture? only seven. Just old enough to hold the trophy. And you couldn't hear music? No, my coach skated with me hand in hand repetitiously till I had it memorized. Amazing, amazing. Next picture. Here's, here's our G-man. I'm just studying. <laughs> just the beginning of three and a half years. Ooh, you look scary here. That's my Thompson 45 submachine gun. <laughs> you were in your 30s. I was in my 30s. Mm -hmm. And here's Hollywood. You know, this is your dog and the Hollywood dog. That's correct. That's what the producer of the show, Dave Johnson. And Sue Thomas's real name in the... Uh, Deanne Bray. Deanne. Beautiful girl. And here, you're helping out with an episode here. Oh, I, I hate to go into a, a difficult place, but um, you, you worked it out with God, why he allowed you to be deaf, but the biggest pain of your life was still to come in the loss of your mother. That's correct. My mom, all of my life, had been my ears telling me everything that was going on. And my speech therapy working overtime with the professional th speech therapist. My uh, skating mentor in the sense, sawing all the sequins. Um, my piano teacher who sat at the piano with me. On and on my whole life, my mother and I were interwoven together, my best friend. And so at the age of 90, I knew that I was losing my mom as she had congestive heart failure, which would have been seven years ago. And at that time, I knew it was going to be our last Christmas. And I had Deanne Bray, the actress, and her mother come and spend Christmas with us. I'm known as a party animal. I love people. <laughs> Christmas is the favorite time of the year to celebrate. So we had a 21-foot Christmas tree. The whole house is just glimmer. The neighbors, we had probably about 50 to 75 neighbors in, where we sat around, we sang the carols. And when it was all over, I laid on the bed with my mom. I had my arms around her, and I said, Mom, what am I going to do when you're gone? I can never, ever have another Christmas, Mom. You're the one that taught me the festival, the parties, the thing. It will be silent. What am I going to do? And I had no idea. That was my last Christmas with my mom. 2003. That was seven years ago. Six years ago, the first Christmas without him, I shared with my traveling companion, my nurse. I said, I can't be here in the house without mom. I don't want to be here. There's no tree. I don't know where we're going, but we can't be here. God already knew the journey you had when probably around the holidays, around Thanksgiving, there was a play in Cleveland in which Deanne Bray's husband was starring in the play. Oh. I wanted to take Deborah, my traveling companion, with me. I said, you got to see this. So we went to Cleveland. After we saw the play, coming back to the hotel, I saw two homeless that were laying on the great in the gutters for the warmth of the heat. I walked by them, I turned around, and I looked at them, and I said, we can't leave them here. We have to take them into the hotel. You were going to take and the homeless people into the hotel? We took them into the hotel. We went back, and I told them, would you like a room for the night? And they just looked at me in disbelief. And they said, Jeff, and we took them into the room. We gave them each a room, and I told the hotel, they get their breakfast, they can have whatever they want. But that night, there was something that was stirring in within me. And the next morning, the one woman called our room 
And she said, I had not had a hot shower, nor a cup of coffee. And she said, I'm ready to go home. I'm ready to get my life back. I will do this. And it was just that ray of hope, that sunshine that came through on the darkest night. That that day, I said to Dumb, I know where I want to be every Christmas Eve, Dumb. I said, we'll be with the homeless on the street. And so for six years, we have walked the streets with the homeless. Six years of Operation Silent Night. Operation Silent Night. My greatest loss with my mother, who had gave me in the Christmas, the spirit, the song Silent Night was given back to me in a way that I could never ever imagine. So you're never home on Christmas Eve. Right. <laughs> and the past six years we've been in the cities of Cleveland and up Pittsburgh. This year, I'm returning to Washington, D.C. Oh, wow. <laughs> and the reason being, we're seeing those that have served in the war, they're coming home, they're displaced. They are still wanting to be with their country, so they're making their foxholes now in D.C. Mm. within the stream. Oh. So Operation Friday Night is very, very close to our heart, and it's just something that we get the people working right with us, different things, you know? Go ahead. You've got comforters from the Amish in we Pennsylvania. Do. They have been making the quilts. And you know, this was one of the most memorable experiences of my life. A couple of years ago, I had this comforter, and there was a man laying on the street. And as I walked up to him, I said, please don't be afraid. I have a very special gift for you. I said, you don't know this person. It's a stranger but she has made this comfort for you. This is to help keep you warm. And I put it over him, and I tucked the comfort under his feet, and I wept, I wept, because I connected with this man, and I thought, this is what Jesus had, and that perfect gift for all of us. It's not about who we know, it's not about the gifts, it's about bringing the love and the comfort and the peace. Wonderful, Sue. What an inspiration. Uh, greatest gift is truly found in giving. Sue's words. Maybe this Christmas something or someone is missing. It's just not going to be the same. You can make the discovery Sue has found. We're going to be giving you an opportunity all this week to step out of yourself and Christmas as usual and make a difference in someone else's life. If you'd like to know more about Operation Silent Night, uh, Sue's wonderful book, her own personal story, I want to encourage you to go to suethomasfbi.com. That's F-B-E-Y-E dot -E com. And we're going to be keeping in touch with you and your wonderful ministry, Sue. God bless you. Thank you. It's great being with you again.